Uh, today, we're going to expand on the concept of cultural control that we briefly covered in our first webinar on the 10 cardinal parameters of plant health and vitality and take a deep dive on IPM and IMM. Cultural control is environmental control, and it's the foundation of any comprehensive IPM plan to manage the pests and microbes present in your cultivation space. It is also the oldest IPM method, but was largely abandoned with the advent of chemical pesticides. The bioecology of the indoor garden was not well understood, creating inconsistent results. Chemical pesticides offered a more reliable and less knowledge and skill dependent solution. But as consumers' desires for clean, pesticide-free cannabis increase, and the toxicity of pesticides becomes further scrutinized by regulators and a scourge on the environment, there is renewed interest in cultural control. Only recently has the pathogen-host environment relationship been understood well enough to harness the power of cultural control to boost secondary metabolite and biomass production. It also serves as a potent risk reduction technique to prevent pests and pathogens and allows cultivators to produce consistent clean cannabis cycle after cycle without the use of harmful chemicals. Just a quick note from the legal department. Due to the federal illegality of cannabis and the variability in state-by-state -state laws, we cannot make specific product rec recommendations for your IPM plan. I'll pass it over to Jesse to kick us off. Right on. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in on this topic. I'll be honest. It's one of the main reasons I'm so passionate about cultivating cannabis. When my mom was diagnosed with cancer, it was about trying to find her the best and strongest possible medicine we could. We went everywhere. We hit every dispensary, every medical outlet, and we purchased products that had mold and mildew. We purchased products that didn't burn right purchased products that were clearly sprayed with pesticides. I remember one, one time I was smoking with my mom in the backyard and she turned to me and she said, oh, this one's a sparkler. Snap, crackle, pop. The bud was doing things it shouldn't have, indicating that it had been sprayed with something, heavy metals, sulfur, something along those lines. It me. I immediately realized the importance of integrated pest management. And it's a controversial topic. There's personal choices, business choices, and legal parameters. But when I had my hydro shop, Oakland Garden Supply, we encouraged people to bring in leaves and media in a bag. We would put things under the scope and we'd look at them. We learned a lot. And the two questions I got more than anything else were, what is this and how do I kill it? And my answer was usually, are you sure you want to kill it? And what are we doing to prevent it? As a result, we became amateur entomologists, microbiologists, and chemists, all in a trial by fire. People would come in and want a solution directly given to them within 10 minutes, and then we would have to look them in the eye the next day and talk about how effective it was. So the idea behind this webinar was really to present the tools and share some of the experiences that I think will further the discussion on IPM and IMM for cannabis. So what is integrated pest management? It's about dealing with and living with and managing pests. Same with IMM, integrated microbe management. Treat them the same way. And I think it probably seems like an oversimplification, but the truth is I've used this triangle and this book to develop hundreds of successful IPM and IMM plans for gardens. The triangle on the left illustrates the progression from prevention to intervention. It starts with cultural control. That's the foundation of IPM. Cultural control is about creating an environment where plants thrive and bag bugs don't. And it's the only non-invasive option. Then we move to physical control, which is about traps, barriers, and the physical removal of pests. Then on to biological control, which is about deploying beneficial insects and good microbes to work on your behalf to eradicate pests. And then finally to chemical control, the application of items toxic to pests that don't kill the plant. The reason I love this book, Hemp Diseases and Pests Management and Biological Control, is because it allows you to look up a pest and understand the progression that you need to take in order to eradicate it. but it's important to know the tools of the trade. 
when we really think about fighting pests and pathogens, it's important to start with good genetics. I mean, I think this is one of the reasons why so many people grew Blue Dream initially. It's a great yielder. It's hard to kill, even when it's covered with mites. But that's really not enough. We need to understand that growing healthy plants is a science. And these tools are going to help you refine the process. It starts with some sort of lighting meter, something to determine the energy that's coming into the space. Lighting, infrared, UV, they're all important. Then you need to think about the temperature and humidity of the ambient space. You need to think about some sort of tool to measure leaf temperature, whether it's a camera or an IR gun, so you can manage VPD, your vapor pressure deficit. Then you should think about measuring the gases in the space, specifically CO2. You'll need some sort of microscope to take a close look at bugs, eggs, and leaves. Sometimes you can even get away with a camera, a microscope app. Then you need some sort of water activity meter to determine whether or not your product is safe for final packaging. And lastly, one tool that I like to use is a refractometer, which essentially measures bricks in the plant. And this is a trick I learned from commercial gardens that grow grapes in Northern California, which is if you can get your bricks level above 12, it's going to be really hard for bugs to eat your plants. So the healthier plants we grow, the less susceptible they are to pests and pathogens. But it's also about creating the right culture. In this case, creating a clean environment. It's important to clean the garden space in between runs. Something like hydrogen peroxide or gases like ozone that really get into the nooks and crannies will help you eliminate the pest vectors. It's also important to remember to do this when the plants aren't in the room because some of these products can have a detrimental effect on the secondary metabolites. Also, you need to clean filters, fans, fertigation lines, and those wild condensate lines. Who knows what's in there? You need to clean them. Clean the plant de debris from the space, from defoliation, dispose of that properly. And also, I think a lot of people know this, but quarantine your plants, but also quarantine your media as it enters the facility. I like to treat every plant and every media that comes into my facility as if it were infected and deal with it appropriately. Then I think something that we've all gotten a lot more used to recently is that people carry pests. We have 10,000 microbes on each hand and we shell 40,000 micro or 40,000 skin cells every single minute. So SOPs are important. Wear gloves, wear hair nets. Also, think about cleaning the ancillary spaces, like the bathroom. Employees use the bathroom. They go in, they play with their phone, then they wash their hands. But when they leave the bathroom, what's on their feet? What's on their pants? Are, are they bringing pathogens into the space? Think about the hallways, the mop sink. These are all vectors, and they either need to be cleaned with technology or with elbow grease. Also, think about cleaning the water. The water that comes into the facility is usually not the biggest obstacle. It's the recycled water. It's about standing water and making sure that standing water is treated appropriately, aerated, because if it's not, it's going to develop water molds that are systemic and you'll feed them directly to your plants. So another way to remember it is start clean, stay clean, finish strong. So now that we have a culture of clean, Let's talk about a culture of success, and that starts with scouting with a microscope, getting positive identification, taking appropriate action, and evaluating. It's a continuous cycle. Keep a log of the pests. Keep a log of the conditions, the fertigation, the water into the space. All these things are important when you think about historical trends and how you're going to eradicate pests for the long haul. Speaking more about positive identification, this is so important to winning the war against the pests that threaten you. Uh, there's an entomologist that I love her work and I love what she has to say, Suzanne Wainwright Evans. She's, um, when she decides to publish her photo book on positive identification, I would spend whatever it costs to get that book because positive identification is critical, like I said. To a lot of people looking at this slide, they might think, man, look at all those bad bugs. 
but they're not all bad bugs. Sure, the majority of them are. But a cautious story, I worked at a facility in Oakland that was an outdoor facility. And I came into work one day and there was a Petri dish filled with larvae and a note that said, Jesse, please kill these bugs as fast as possible. And I sighed. I picked up the Petri dish. I opened it up. I walked outside and I sprinkled the ladybug larva all over the plants. It was an inappropriate identification of a pest. So it's critical that you know good bugs and bad bugs. Otherwise, you'll be trying to kill all the guys that are trying to help you fight the war. Positive identification of microbes is also important. This is a chance to bring in a microbiologist to talk about which microbes are good and which microbes are bad, which microbes you have in your compost tea, which microbes you have in your space. They can take samples and they can give you a really good idea of what you're working with. But furthermore, get to know your shapes and structures. Once you start to know this, you can really do an amateur evaluation and identification under a microscope. Uh, another story of caution here when it comes to positive identification is I had a friend who had a 500 light facility and he said, Hey Jesse, one of my rooms, we had catastrophic loss in week four. Everything just died because of root aphids. Please come assess the situation and tell me how to kill the root aphids. I went to the facility. I looked through the media. I dug through the root zone. I looked at every plant I possibly could. I couldn't find larva. I couldn't find eggs. Maybe I found some fungus gnats, but I sure didn't find root aphids. And then it hit me. You have pythium. I could see it on the stalks of the plant. So I said, let's go look at your water source. So we immediately went to his water source, which is a 250 gallon tank outside of the room that wasn't aerated, wasn't treated with UV, wasn't treated with anything. And I could see the black mold growing on top of the water surface. And what I said was, all right, you're feeding your plants pythium and they're going to die. You're feeding them a systemic water mold that's going to kill them. That's the problem, not root aphids. So all the effort, all the time, and all the money you spent trying to kill root aphids that weren't there were just simply not effective. Positive identification is critical. So... When it comes to positive ID, let's assume for a second that we've made one. We have mites and we have powdery mildew. But which mites? Are they carmine mites? Are they russet mites? Are they broad mites? In this case, we have a picture of two spotted mites and powdery mildew. So now that we know who our enemy is, let's learn everything we can about them. Do every bit of research you can. Consult the Hemp Disease book. Look at everything you can possibly read to understand how these things grow and live. So a little bit on powdery mildew. We know that it thrives in low light conditions with poor air circulation and excess nitrogen. We know it's spread by the air and we know that it's spread faster in high humidity environments. And we also know that it's all around us. Spider mites, right? We know they feed on these particular two spotted spider mites feed on chlorophyll rich plants. The females lay 200 eggs every eight days they prefer hot and dry conditions, cold temperatures cause hibernation, and the light cycle is going to impact their action. So this gives us the things that we need to know. What are the pests susceptible to? How do they feed? How do they breed? How do they move? Where do they hide? And how do we pierce their armor? Well, the first step is understanding how we prevent this infestation in the first place. So we need to understand cultural control. Again, for any pest, it's about creating an environment where they can't thrive. So how do we do that? Well, at Inspire, we model every room so we know where the air flows so we can create the right pressures. We remove oscillating fans and pocket dehumidifiers so they don't create microclimates or become the source of pests. Then it's about air cycling. Every three minutes, we try to cycle through multi-stage filtration. First, through a MERV-13 capture filter, which gets everything down to about one micron. Then through a photocatalytic oxidation process, which is essentially UV light shining on titanium dioxide, which creates hydroxyl radicals that function like a molecular shredder. Then, in-rack airflow will continue the airflow cycle by delivering the CO2-rich conditioned air without radical oxidative species directly to the plant stomata to break up the canopy, which further eliminates microclimates. And lastly, it's about control. 
control of the temperature, control of the humidity, when the lights are on, when the lights are off, and during the transitions. Swings in temperature and humidity create an environment for powdery mildew to take hold. And precision control will allow you to manage your VPD, your vapor pressure deficit, at every stage of the plant growth, which will help mitigate the risk of powdery mildew. It's also important to note, understanding light penetration, temperature, humidity, airflow, nutrient dilution, watering rate, they all play a big role in the formation and spread of powdery mildew. So get control of your culture and powdery mildew won't affect the bottom line. Don't get control and you'll need to prepare for a war every single flower run. So what's the next type of control? It's physical control. What could we have done physically to prevent the spread of this? Well, first let's check the air pressures and make sure that we have a positively pressured space. Let's check the SOPs and make sure that everyone is wearing gloves when they handle the plants. We want to make sure that your master gardener isn't playing with their pit bull before they come into the shop. And we want to make sure that house flies aren't entering either. Who knows where your pit bull was last night? And spider mites can hitch a ride on the back of house flies and get into your facility. So it's not the flies that are the problem, but they are the vector. So what's the solution? Amputate and remove leaves at the initiation of outbreak. We had mentioned two spotted spider mites lay 200 eggs every eight days. So by removing those leaves, we can remove a significant amount of eggs, sometimes a lot more than 200. But again, be careful because if we remove too many leaves, that's going to affect the plant's vitality. The next stage of control is biological control which really deals with the three Ps, predators, parasites, and pathogens. This is another opportunity to bring an entomologist to the party, but the resources are out there. It makes me think of my friend, Charlie McKenzie, and the crop walk team who does an IPM audit. They'll walk your facility, tell you what bio biologicals would help you win the war. And in this case, we have two spotted spider mites. So we might choose Californicus and Persimilis, they both work a little bit differently. They're a little bit diff different sizes, but they're both going to eat mites and eggs. And it's important to know because if we think we're going to bring rove beetles in here, then they're going to live in the media and not on the leaf tissue and not be quite as effective for what we need. And then we can think about biological control with microbes. It's a chance for you to bring a microbiologist to the party to talk about which microbes are going to thrive in our space, how we're going to get these microbes. Is it teas? Is it ferments? Is it purchasing individual microbes? And if you take a close look at this slide, you can see we might choose Bacillus pamilis, which is a fungicide, Bacillus subtilis, which eats powdery mildew, Streptomyces, Trichoderma. There's a lot of choices here that we can ap apply from a biological standpoint to eradicate the threats of powdery mildew. There are also beneficial bacteria that consume eggs and ward, ward off bugs. So it's, it's a real option for you, but it takes an understanding of microbiology to deploy. Then the next step is chemical control. So this is the chance for you to bring another ist to the party, a chemist. And this chemist is going to tell us what's in every bottle and how it works and how it affects the plant. There's a lot of tough decisions to make here. Are we going to go with biorational insecticides? Or are we going to go with synthetic insecticides? There essentially are two main camps when you really break it down. The long-term prevention and eradication of pests fall into the oils and soaps category or the sulfur category. And one of the major reasons we differentiate the two is because we can't apply them both at the same time. It's not a matter of just going into the IPM cupboard, grabbing a bottle and applying it. We need to know how these things work as a synergy. If we apply oils, then we really can't apply sulfur within the next 14 days or we'll burn our plants. So it's an important consideration the chemistry, the makeup, and how they impact the plant. All right, so which path do we choose? This is where it becomes a personal and business decision, and it gets really tricky. 
This is really about understanding the interaction between technology, the farmer, the market, and enforcement. There are a lot of things at play when determining the appropriate IPM strategy for your cultivation facility. It's a delicate balance of risk and reward, but it's also a personal choice that will affect the business bottom line. So legality, and this is something that Brian mentioned earlier, federally illegal, uh, it becomes a gray area when deciding which, which pesticides and which biological control methodologies to deploy. Federally, there are no guidelines. State by state, there are varying guidelines. So it's important to know in your state what you can and can't use. And that's important because testing is the enforcement arm. So we need to know what's going to show up on a test, how it's going to show up, and what's the cost of that. So if you use a substance you shouldn't, or you use a substance that's allowed, but you use it at the wrong time, it will show up as a fail for residual pesticides. And that will be a compromise to the end product, and it will be a compromise to the brand. It's often very hard to recover from something like this. And next in making this decision, it's about understanding the factors of influence. And I think a lot of times when we think about factors of influence, we think about doing a cost-benefit analysis. How does this system make sense for us? Where is the risk? Where is the reward? What are the costs? So it's about taking the historic IPM triangle and incorporating it into your business plan for long-term success understanding the modes of action, how things work, understanding the environmental considerations. How do they work in your space and how do they affect the spaces outside of yours? What are the application guidelines? What's the dilution rate? How much does it cost to use it? What are the timelines for e efficacy? What are the timelines for your needs? What are the stages of development that you're encountering with your particular pest? What's the systemic acquired response? How are the plants going to respond to this? Can we prep them for a threat? And what are the synergies? How do these things work together? And I'll try and go through them really quickly. So modes of action. There are a lot of different modes of action. And there are good resources out there that break them down in even more detail. But essentially, we're talking about how are we going to physically kill the bugs? Are we going to dehydrate them? Are we going to suffocate them? Are we going to get them to eat something that kills them from the inside? Are we going to affect their nervous system? by either over-activating them or slowing their development? Are we going to prevent them from molting? Are we going to prevent them from developing into the next stage? And also, I think there's a great picture here in the lower right corner um, that if you've read Jeff Lowenfeld's book, Teaming with Microbes, or studied with Dr. Elaine Ingham, you'll know that this is a fungal hyphae that is strangling a root-feeding nematode. Pretty cool mode of action in my book. Then you have the environmental considerations, just like I mentioned. All the IPM and IMM decisions you make will either impact the environment or will be impacted by the environment. Your brand might be more well-received if you choose the least toxic path. But the application environment, like temperature, humidity, and airflow, can have a dramatic impact on management efficacy. If you're playing the microbe and biological angle, think about creating environmental conditions for them to thrive. Beneficials need habitat. They need a food source. They need appropriate temperatures in day and night so that they can breed and they can establish for the long haul. Also, think about environmental considerations for chemis the chemistry you might use. For example, sulfur is going to be much more effective in a high humidity environment when the temperatures are below 80 degrees. In a dry and hot environment, you apply sulfur, you will burn the plants. Then you have to think about application guidelines. How do I apply this product? Is it a dust? Do I spray it on the leaves? Do I dose it in line? Where do I deploy the sachets of insects? What's the personal protective equipment I need for this application? What's the dilution rate per acre, per canopy, per plant? The math can get confusing. When do I apply it? Where do I apply it? In the root zone, the undersides of the leaves, the tops of the leaves? Well, for mites, we know we need to focus on the undersides of the leaves. And for PM, it's going to be 
all over the plant, but important considerations. Timelines. Timelines are of utmost importance as well for reapplication, for toxicity, toxicity to the bug, toxicity to the plant. We need to understand the time that it takes the fungal hyphae to develop so it can strangle that root feeding nematode. We need to understand how long it takes resistance to occur in the bug. We need to understand that so we know when to rotate the modes of action. We need to understand how long it takes the plant to build up defenses so we're building up the defenses to the utmost capability before these threats come. We need to understand how long it takes these applications to be effective. How long does it take them to work? How long before we judge whether that application was or wasn't effective? What's the half-life? How long does it work for? And what's the re-entry period for worker safety? How long do we have to wait before we can go back into the space and start growing? Another factor of influence is thinking about the stages of development. First, the stage of development of the plant, then the stage of development of the pest. We want to kill all stages of the pest development while considering all stages of the growth. So for something like our two spotted mites, we're going to want an ovicide, a larvicide, a pupicide, and an adulticide. We want to kill them at every stage. For the powdery mildew, we want to think about something that's going to deal with the pustules, the spores, and the fruiting bodies. Important to consider all of those factors and deploy different mode of actions varied at different timelines to be most effective. Something to think about. Sulfur is going to kill powdery mildew and mites really well. But when you get into late stage flower, if you spray your skittles with sulfur, they're going to turn into rotten eggs. So it's important to understand the stage of development, the application, and its impact on the final product. Then we get to systemic acquired response. And this is essentially getting the plant to fight back for you. It has natural defenses. And with hormones, acids, enzymes, and microbes, we can trigger the plant's natural responses. I love salicylic acid. It's a product that you can apply to your plant to get it more turgid, to get it more rigid, to have the plant be very strong and very hard to eat from a leaf tissue and a root zone perspective. Also, I love to apply seaweed or kelp. And one of the main reasons for that, outside of the fact that I love to eat seaweed, is it's filled with beneficial hormones in a very balanced application. Cytokinins, auxins, and gibberellins will all help the plant trigger its natural defense mechanism and fight off this plant. So in reality, or fight off this pest, in reality, what we're trying to do is uh, uh, prepare the plant for war at all times and allow the plant to defend itself naturally. And then that brings us to synergies. And this is about how the choices that you make interact with each other. How do they interact with the microbes, the beneficials? How do the chemicals kill beneficials? How do they kill the bad guy? How do they affect the plant? And again, synergies, sulfurs and oils, right? We can't spray them at the same time. Otherwise, we will burn their plant. How do your choices interact with your personal consciousness? And how do they impact the bottom line, efficacy, price point, branding, and the final product? At the end of the day, what I usually say is your IPM and IMM strategy will have a tremendous impact on how your plant grows. Every IPM and IMM choice you make has an impact on the pest, the plant, and the environment. The more that you can prevent, the less you'll have to intervene and accept the negative impacts physical, biological, and chemical control can have on plant vitality, yield, and quality of your finished flowers and extracts. I like to say, control your culture or it will control you. And what I mean by that is that a lack of control will necessitate consistent intervention and leads to inconsistent results. Physical, biological, and chemical control require training and misapplications do happen. 
sometimes with disastrous results. Whereas proper cultural control has no negative impacts on the plant. It will never burn your plant and it synergizes with every aspect of your cultivation operation. Cultural control is environmental control. It's the foundation of any IPM and IMM strategy and the key to consistent high quality harvests. If you don't have good environmental control, you will always be battling pests and you will never know how many grams per square foot or hundreds of dollars per pound it is costing you. And with that, I'd love to sort of jump into some q and I tried to go through that pretty quick so we could tackle some real world questions, which we saw a lot of come in before the webinar as well. Uh, first question here from Ben. Uh, you didn't answer how I kill PM and mites. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a great question, Ben. And I appreciate that. And it's something that um, I think definitely takes a conversation with the individual gardener on making the appropriate approach. But let me put it this way. It starts with cultural control. You need to have a clean space. Um, and then the progression goes something like this, right? We need to get cultural control so we can prevent this from happening in the future. We need to get cultural control so the applications that we take are most effective. For me, I like to start with if there's an outbreak, immediately go to physical control. Remove the leaves that you see being hot spots for possible vectors, contamination, and spread. And then it's about building this castle cell wall with microbiology. Uh, I had mentioned a handful of beneficial fungi and bacteria that work against powder and mildew and might work against mites in the space. Uh, but my feeling is it's all about diversity. Let's throw every beneficial microbe we can at this plant and see how she responds. Let's give her every tool in the toolbox. We don't know enough about microbiology and plants for me to say, this is the answer. Instead, I say, think about teas, ferments, read some good books that are challenging, um, challenging what we know and allowing us to really dive into different microbiological answers. Then it comes to to an actual deployment of beneficial insects, right? So in this particular case, like let's bring insects to the party, but what if we're indoors? Maybe that's not an option. Like I don't want to burn a bunch of ladybugs and I don't want to clean up a bunch of dead carcasses. So same time, I'm thinking, give me diversity. Give me as many beneficials as I can. Let's get them in the root zone. Maybe they're not a direct impact on that spider mite, but they're going to help us, you know, uh, soil mites or rove beetles, beneficial nematodes, get them all to the party. Um, so they can try and work for you 24 hours a day, the entire time before we have to get to chemical. And then when it comes to chemical, I sort of tend to find myself in the oils and soaps category a lot. So I think about some sort of extract that might affect the mites as a nerve toxin, something like pyrethrin derived from chrysanthemum. I would mix that with an oil that would suffocate uh, maybe another oil or an extract that would prevent breeding, um, prevent feeding, and, um, and prevent the, the larval development. So something like neem. Then we need something that's going to mix those things together and make them more effective as an application. So a surfactant like soap. And then I like a penetrant. I love penetrants to kill eggs, whether it's citric acid or alcohol or something of that nature. Now, when we think about what we just went over, oils, soaps, and alcohols, those are also really effective against powdery mildew. So that's a pretty good synergistic first pass of, hey, that's an application that's going to kill both of these things. It needs to be done appropriately with the appropriate dilutions at the appropriate timelines with the appropriate environmental conditions, but they are absolutely effective. And for me, it's really about understanding what the ultimate goal is to get great flower. So if we can get environmental control, we can do preventative applications during the vegetative process, build the castle cell wall. And then in the first two weeks of flower, take action if we need to from a chemical perspective, and then kick back and let those plants develop without additional foliar applications that degrade our product and compromise our quality in the end. So uh, sort of my awesome. approach there. 
Yeah. Thanks, Jesse. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It seems like um, the, that IPM triangle has been sort of flipped on its head uh, over the last few decades or so. And people start with chemical control, but it should be really reversed and started with chemical control first as a prevent, or excuse me, uh, cultural control first as a prevention method. And I think we're, we're still discovering, right? When I had my hydro shop, everyone just wanted to come in and buy a poison. And I would say like, Hey, think about talking to the beneficial insectary and seeing what they have available. Talk to dragonfly earth, talk to mammoth P they make microbes research. Dr. Elaine Ingham, look at the soil food web, take a look at Korean natural farming and one straw revolution. Look into these other methodologies that are historically viable and have worked for hundreds of years in other locations, understand what's working for them and incorporate that because it's so much more cost effective with so much less degradation to your product. If you can take that, that approach of prevention before mm-hmm. intervention. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of a line of last resort with, uh, with the chemicals. Mm-hmm. Um, an interesting question sort of par- parlaying on the, on the concept of, of microbes and microbiology and pests uh, from Anders um, he's saying some growers seem to be taking a sterile clean room approach to IPM, whereas others are utilizing natural defenses like biologics and beneficials. Do you think a hybrid approach of the two methodologies is achievable while being practical in day-to-day workflow and cost effective in terms of production costs? Or do you think this approach will lessen the efficacies of both schools of thought? That's a great question. That's a great question. And what I usually say is that Every facility I've ever been into has pests and there are cultivators out there that will attest to me walking to their facility and them saying, Hey man, this room's really clean. Me flipping over a bug and or flipping over a plant and saying, but what about these eggs? What are these guys? So in short, what I would say is it's really, really hard to have a perfectly sterile environment. Um, And then on the flip side of that, there's, there's a benefit to sterility, you know, and I'm a big fan of trying to be as clean as possible. I think what happens is you get these two schools of thought and they think that they're diametrically opposed. And the reality is, is that yes, so many chemical applications, whether it's hydrogen peroxide and acetic acid with xeritol or some sort of other spray like sulfur, which is going to kill our beneficials are not going to work with the microbiology. And that's true. And I used to say this all the time too, encouraging people that were using synthetic nutrients in their feeding schedule to incorporate compost teas. Look, those synthetic nutrients, some of these chemical poisons and toxins will kill microbes, but the strong will survive. So if we kill 60% of the microbes with our sterile approach, we still have 40% of the microbes that don't care about what you're throwing at them. So for me, yeah, I mean, there's, there is a marriage in there somewhere that allows for a realistic application of, you know, a sterile environment and what it takes to do that. Well, at the same time, embracing microbiology um, and, and beneficials. So there's a cost and benefit there, but yes, I think it's viable to blend the two of them. Um, I think the more momentum you can build with microbiology and beneficials, the better that momentum is what's going to carry you through those last four weeks of flower. Um, and if you need to, you can apply some of these chemical sterile uh, approaches, but don't be afraid to mix the two. See, see who survives and who the strongest ones are. You know, if pathogen pressures are cumulative, does it make sense to do as much as you can all the way through the cycle, right? You know, we, we go into rooms where they've got the pads full of alcohol or whatever, some other sterilizing um, media that you step in before you walk in. We see people gown up. Um, I've seen that on smaller room grows, it can be a real hassle in terms of workflow. If you're going from one room to another and the, the movement is, uh, you know, the duration in a room is short, then it is really going to hamper your workflow. But when we go to large greenhouses, for example, they're going to be in this bay for two hours or three hours at a time. Um, you know, what's that break-even point? Is, do we, do we, is there a break-even point we've noticed in the facilities we've been in or should we just be doing it all over the place? Well, I think, again, it's sort of going back and referencing that triangle, right? 
It's about starting with a culture of clean. And what does it take to get that culture of clean and make decisions that are appropriate for that? But then when it comes to plant health, it's important to think about the stages of physical, biological, and then chemical. So just because you're trying to create a clean environment doesn't necessarily mean you have to exclude beneficials. We are trying to create an environment that doesn't have bad pests and pathogens, no pythium, no botrytis, no powdery mildew, no aspirillus, but those are not the beneficials we're bringing in. So for me, it's like, let's bring in some beneficials that work on our behalf. Let's try and keep the the room as sterile and clean as possible in between the rooms, gas the room to make sure that we don't have that vector. But at the same time, if you think that you're going to skip those first three steps of cultural, physical, and biological control, it will be very expensive to continue to apply the right chemicals and the right processes to make sure that you have a sterile environment. And in the end, you're probably not going to achieve it. It's so rare that I've walked into a facility and I thought, man, it's going to be hard for me to find a pest here. It's usually I just walk in and go to the mop sink or go to the bathroom or go to the doorknob (laughs) And just like, hey, let's do a swab, send this off to the lab, see what comes back. And people are shocked. Yeah. But I mean, pet pests are one thing. Like may, maybe there's a way to keep them all out. But you talk about microscopic microbes and the fact that we're shedding microbes off of our skin at such a high rate. I don't, I don't sort see. Sort of a scary thought, right? Uh, it's crazy. It's crazy to think about. I, I just, I don't see how there'd be any way to per, to really create an entirely sterile environment. So to me, it makes a lot of sense to foster the good microbes and the, the beneficial pests potentially, because I just, it just seems like an impossible thing to achieve. And I'll say this though, I've seen a lot of automation developments in automation where we're trying to get more people out of that space, more items out of that space, more vectors out of that space. So instead of having someone come in, that's wearing gloves and a Tyvek suit, that's four inches too short on the arm. And every time they brush against the leaf, they bring on whatever's mm-hmm. on their arm. Mm-hmm. You know, now we're trying to get to the point where it's like, should we automate this completely? Should we have sensors and cameras in the room telling us what pests are there or where we have an issue in the canopy that looks different than the rest of the, the canopy? Right. Should we have, you know, basically a running set of, you know, mechanical scissors that come and trim up the cannabis appropriately. I've seen these things explored. And and one of the reasons is because it's so hard to keep a room clean and people coming in, you know, they, they bring in their pests with them a lot of times. Yeah. Gosh, darn. It's uh, yeah. I I mean, you're, you got to do tissue culture to make sure your genetics are clean, make sure the media that you're planting the, the, plantlets into are clean that you know there's zero interference from from humans and then i mean i guess i wonder also um if if it's a sterile in fact a sterile environment what are you missing if you don't have beneficial microbes within within your ecosystem is are you are you growing good the best plants that you can are you getting the terpene and the cannabinoid content and the the biomass that is potential in the in the genetics yeah, I, I think there's a whole another webinar of me yes. blab, blabbing on my soapbox <laughs> about how great microbes are. But the research is out there and more is coming. The benefits, the yield benefits. I mean, a company that I look at is, is Mammoth Pea. You know, they work with a lot of people. They show you how much more you can yield with the benefit of microbes. They show you how you can unlock uh, nutrients in a different way. Um, but then it's really embracing it from a synergistic, you know, position where it's like, if you're just going to feed nutrient salts, do you have the appropriate cation exchange? Do you have amino acids? Do you have B1 vitamins? It's about thinking about plant health from a holistic perspective and microbes play a role. Whether you like it or not, there are going to be microbes on your plant, even in a sterile environment. Rob and I have talked about this. It's like, well, maybe we bring hydrogen peroxide gas or radical oxidative species to the plant in order to make sure that the plant's sterile, right? But the reality is that's probably going to wipe out the beneficial microbe cell wall that we have on the plant or in the root zone that's allowing those, those nutrients to be more available or creating nutrient cycling so the plant can eat hundreds and hundreds of times a day rather than just the one to five times you feed it. Um, mm-hmm. 
it's again, it's about synergy and it's about understanding the risk reward and costs and, and cost benefit analysis there too. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And just really quick uh, question from, from Pat Jacker, just really asking for a little elaboration here um, about uh, Jesse, your LinkedIn post about the health of the cuticle and um, the, the plant waxes deterring powdery mildew. And yeah. uh, so I think that's a little bit different than the systemic acquired response And the plant is essentially, it has these waxes on it that allow it to photosynthesize and transpire and deal with the external environment. And what I've seen is that, you know, one of the biggest pest vectors is when leaves die. Now that I believe sends off pheromones from the plant that attracts these negative insects that say, oh, this plant's weak, let's come eat it. Right. Um, and at the same time, those dead leaves are a potential habitat for powdery mildew or botrytis. So for me, and this is probably a conversation that might set Rob off, it's about accurately controlling um, the VPD. It's about making sure that the moisture content in the air relative to the leaf tissue temperature is appropriate. So we're not drying out those cuticular waxes. We want them to remain as long as possible because they're the best defense, especially in late stages against these infestations. So again, it comes back to the tools of the trade, know how to measure what's in your space, know how to measure the plant and know how to control. So you don't have too much wind or too much heat that are destroying those waxes and making the plant more, more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesse, you hit the hot button. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, just, I don't disagree with you. Look, the cuticular membrane is a very important part of plant physiology. Um, what, whether it's receptive to VPD or just relative humidity of the air and air velocity, I don't know, right? I, you know, I, I don't know enough about the cuticular membrane and what it's sensitive to. Um, that particular article, I, yeah, I get it. There is very good data in that article that um, Pat's talking about. But, um, you know, I'm always very sensitive to leaf canopy temperature, right? I, I, I didn't see that. Um, I didn't see that touched on heavily enough for my own liking, because whenever we talk about VPD around the office or with anybody, it's how are you measuring VPD? Is it that you know, we saw that we saw a chart in that article that is the one that's very popular online, um, that's a static chart. VPD changes constantly and it's different in your entire canopy at different heights of your canopy. Uh, you just have to make a best guess with it. Sometimes using the best tools you have, we use the cameras, you know, other people have different tools, but that's the only thing I, I would say, you know, VPD is absolutely vital for plant health. If the plant has got lots of vigor. It will be able to fight off all sorts of pests and pathogens if the relative humidities go off, you know, you look at that chart on one of the slides, it's the relative humidity where you get into the danger zones of pathogen proliferation. So, yeah, and I would say, I, I, you know, we've talked about this and we will continue to talk about this, but I also think BPD is really important for bricks. And if you really want to accumulate more sugars and vitamins and minerals inside your plant tissue, it's important to control transpiration the right way. And if you want to get to a 12 on the brick scale, you really need to make sure that you're appropriately controlling vapor pressure deficit so the plant can take up the mobile and immobile nutrients that it needs and redistribute them appropriately so that you get, you know, a healthy plant from tip to stem to root. So when you do that test, you know, it's reflecting plant health and VPD is one of the ways to get your bricks higher. Um, and, and also I would say that this is one thing I think we totally agree on, Rob, whether it's VPD or relative humidity or airflow or whatnot, those cuticular waxes are important. And it's just something that we should think about and consider and talk about how to protect. And that was one of the main things I wanted to, um, put out there by sharing Todd's article was like, Hey, Let's think about these cuticular waxes. Let's think about VPD. Let's think about humidity and, and how it plays a role in integrated pest management. The analog is skin health, right? If you, if you don't have, um, you know, supple enough skin, if the, you know, the cholesterol in your skin goes away, which is, you know, a problem with some people, it cracks. And this is an infection uh, zone for your skin, right? That is a 
true for plants. It's true for people. We have to be very sensitive to it. So I get that. I 100% agree. We don't argue about that. I don't think. Right. Got it. So plant defenses as an IPM strategy, build, really building the the vigor of the plant as a as a an ability to to defend itself against attacks. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Makes makes good sense. Um, another one here from Francis is is there an IPM strategy for curing? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's. I think a lot of people don't think about what happens when you cure or the potential for pests. And a really quick aside story is I have a friend uh, who whose dad is sick and was had grown grown weed a long time ago, and he had uh, put it away when it was far too wet, and it developed all kinds of problems. Um, it had all kinds of molds growing on it, and when he would smoke that cannabis he would literally pass out. He would black out and wake back up. And it was, it was, Hey, does weed go bad? Or, you know, are, is there something in these rolling papers that's hurting me? And it wasn't until we really realized like, you know, there's probably a lot of things in this product that you could have dealt with before you put it in the jar. And if you just would have had an appropriate curing strategy, you wouldn't have the botrytis, the pythium and the powdery mildew that are all over this cannabis and it would be safe to smoke. Um, so for me, it's also a thing with my mom. It's like when trying to find safe cannabis early on in the deregulated market, people would sell anything because there was no testing. Now we have testing. It's not just about testing for residual pesticides. It's, it's testing for E. coli. It's testing for salmonella. It's testing for aspirillus. And these are things that it can occur in the curing process. So for me, it's really important to make sure that we migrate the moisture from the interior of the bud to the exterior of the bud in a, in a linear fashion. We don't want the moisture to migrate back in because then that will trap water inside that will become anaerobic and bring up anaerobic pathogens. In addition to that, we need to make sure that the water activity inside of the buds when we go to finally package them is below 20%. Everyone's got a different signature. Some people in some counties are even testing for this, which I think is really cool. But the idea is, is that if you put cannabis in an airtight environment with water activity over 20, it's going to sporulate. Things are going to grow in there. And if you can get the water activity below 20, then there's not going to be activity. There's not going to be migration inside the bud that leads to sporulation of these, these pathogens and pests. And then a lot of people don't filter the air in their curing space. I mean, for years, I would just hang it in my garage and blast it with air <laughs> and then throw away 20% because I'm like, ooh, you know, you get in there, you start trimming away to roll yourself a joint. And you're like, oh, that one's moldy. Let's heave, heave ho on that one and move on to the next one, knowing that those spores were probably just circulated in the space and without appropriate biological filtration or just passing them from one bud to another. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think to that end, moving a lot of air through the room gets that homogeneity of the environment which gives you some reassurance that every bud in the drying and curing area is getting a consistent temperature and humidity around it to keep the moisture moving in the right direction. So if to move a lot of air and if you have the opportunity to move air, you should be cleaning it as you move it. There's no excuse. So, you know, we, we use a strategy, um, you know, of trapping with high efficiency filtration and then, uh, photocatalytic oxidation downstream to clean the coil, but also clean the air with the molecular shredder. And also seal that room, right? I mean, that's one of the physical barriers you can do to create pests and pathogens coming in. I mean, I know people too that have had a handful of spider mites on their plant and they're like, no, it's pretty good. It's not affecting my bottom line. And then they go to cure. And then, you know, eight days later, we've had thousands and thousands of eggs hatch. And those mites are like, man, I got to eat this really quickly before it dries out. And all of a sudden you're coming in with a vacuum cleaner, trying to suck webbing off of buds that you think are going to be sellable. Not going to happen. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, well, uh, Je Jeff had a question here that I think was just addressed um, about how important particulate control is in IPM and how it's best controlled in cannabis cultivation. If you guys have anything else to add there, um, please, please do so. Um, well, I think, go ahead, Rob. No, I, I was just going to say, I think it's, it has a lot to do for me about third-party testing data. 
Like if someone says, I'm going to do this, I need to see the proof in the pudding. So many times I've been misled by people selling a product that hasn't been tested, that hasn't been tried, especially in the emerging cannabis industry. When I had my shop every day, someone would try and come in and sell me something that didn't work, that didn't work. And it was up to me to do the research and find out how it worked, how it would be effective in my facility. Would it synergize with my team and how I go about IPM? What are the costs to deploy it? And, you know, it, so often people aren't thinking about the facility and the cultivation space as a whole. And all of a sudden people are like, oh, ozone works great. Just pump it into your room and it'll kill everything. And it's like, well, man, I've worked in rooms that are filled with ozone. I've left dizzy with nosebleeds and thought, man, I didn't have to do much in there today because everything was dead. But am I dying too? You know? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's a, uh, yeah, man, it's a scary thought. And uh, it's, it's a balance between risk and reward, right? I mean, some radical oxidative species, some stress to the plant is good. Persistent stress is bad. Um, and use, it to clean the room, use it to clean the room between plants. Sure. But do everything else you can to prevent those oxidative species from oxidizing the terpenes that you're trying to preserve or oxidizing the THC you're trying to preserve. So, uh, and the, and the cell wall, cell membranes, things like that. So some of those things might be totally deployable in a cloning and vegetative and mother room space, you know, but not deployable in a flowering space, but at the same time, understand how that's going to affect your other approaches. Is that going to kill the microbiology? Is that going to destroy the rhizophagus irregularis that's getting you bigger roots faster is that going to kill the glomus mose that needs six months or six weeks to develop in order to keep heavy metals in the root zone and prevent them from going up into the plant? These are compromises you might make by bringing in um, some other sort of advanced filtration technique. Got it. Okay. Good one, guys. Um, shift gears real quick. Uh, question from uh, Chris uh, can one unit be utilized to control both vegetative and flower stage? Uh, one HVACD unit? Yeah, I, I believe so. Question? Yeah, mm -hmm. so the answer is yes. Uh, it's okay. Yes and no. So the difference, <laughs> there's, there's a distinct calculation that goes along with a vegetative state room and another one for a flower room. And typically flower has got a higher pound per hour moisture removal requirement um, the same amount of airflow, if the room's the same size, we'd probably see the same amount of airflow every two to three minutes. We'd be changing the air in the room. Um, you've got to make sure that if you're going to use one unit, it can handle the highest load in flower and the lowest load in veg. So many times we get into a veg room and the minimum stage on the HVACD unit is pulling too much water out of the room and we need humidifiers. I mean, it's crazy, but you've got all this room full of humidifiers, plants, and then you have to add humidification. So our units don't seem to suffer from this problem. We turn down everything, fans to compressors to the energy recovery system. Um, so we can get down to very, very small, zero moisture removal, just complete sensible. And then all the way up to the high latent removal, uh, we can do both. But you've just got to make sure when you're sizing the unit, it can handle both sides of the spectrum. I think to piggyback off of that too, Thanks, Rob. That was great. And what I usually say is, you know, if you size the system for your flower room, then and it's the same space and the same plant count, it should be able to handle the bedroom. This question also might be bringing up the fact that people want to run one HVAC unit for both their flower and veg. And that's where it gets really tricky, right? Because those, okay. con those conditional set points are so different. The, the VPD is different for those spaces, you know, for the, the stage of growth. So you might have to compromise both spaces if you think you're going to run one unit for flower and veg. But absolutely the same unit, if sized appropriately, could do veg or flower. The, yeah, the keyboard being there, turn down. So you have to have the turn down ability to handle the veg, the lower load in veg, all the way up to the higher load in, in flower. Yeah. Great. All right. Thanks for clarifying that, guys. Um, on, on a similar line of thinking, um, Anders is asking, can some of these pesticides, some of the essential oils 
and pe- and other pesticides being sprayed indoors damage HVAC equipment? Good question. I think the answer is yes. Um, radical oxidative species will tear up plastics like nobody's business if you've got a persistent amount of them. Um, usually what we find is they are, I think they are oxidative to either copper or aluminum of some sort. So vaporized hydrogen peroxide, as an example, is vaporized. And as long as it stays in the vapor gas phase, we're okay. As soon as it starts condensing and landing on the coils, you may run into problems. So if your coils are running and cooling and pulling out, turning vaporized hydrogen peroxide into liquid hydrogen peroxide uh, at high enough concentrations on the coil, you'll go through aluminum real quick, as my understanding of it. Uh, we recommend coil coatings if that is your cleaning the room IPM strategy. Um, so we've seen this come up in a, in a number of different projects, but usually the answer is just don't run your cooling coils while you're doing the room cleaning. Let the temperatures rise up and allow more of that vaporized hydrogen peroxide to get into the air hmm. because you're just vaporizing. So, Got but, it. You know, yeah, and here's another thing about that. You know, anytime you're using UV lights. So UV lights can be used as a surface cleaner. We use them as part of the PCO mechanism to create the oxidative radicals with the titanium, titanium dioxide mesh. UV light will tear apart plastics. Again, you need to have hardened surfaces, UV hardened surfaces or conduit, metal conduit for all your plastic wiring, uh, plastic sheathed wiring inside your air handling units. And you you can get a mile of of wiring inside an air handling unit pretty easily. Um, It's one of those things you don't want to overlook because you will start shorting out sensors, start shorting out electrical circuits and then, you know, pop goes a circuit. And to add to that, too, this is actually off topic, but it just got me thinking about what these applications do to the machines in your space, but also to the final product. And, you know, I'd been a big proponent of neem for a long time and different oils just because they mesh with my strategy and they have low impact on um, the environment and the beneficials. And what I started to learn was that, you know, I might have a product that's considered fantastic top tier, high grade flower. And then when I put it through the extraction process, there've been extractors that pointed out to me, it's like, man, I'm getting incredible yields out of your product, like to the point that I don't understand what's going on. And then we dig a little bit deeper and we realize, oh, stylet oil and neem oil are now product part of my extract. So just another reason to seriously consider what's going to attach itself to the trichomes, what's going to attach itself to the secondary metabolites, bond with that and carry through. And the casual smoker in low doses might say, man, I love it. It gives it a whole new flavor. Or they might say, hey, I don't, you know, this isn't as great a product or it might cause more oxidation in long-term storage. Or what triggered it for me was knowing that so many extracts concentrate these applications and all of a sudden you have heavy metals you have oils Mm. in the concentrate even though you did very minimal application during the growth stages wild yeah jesse i want to congratulate you for saying trichomes the right way hey i get one right every once in a while man (laughs) hey get one right i mean you know don't make me say pillow or windmill man (laughs) you just did oh crap (laughs) <laughs> um, yeah, uh, w- with regard to Anders, Anders' question as well, um, it makes me think about um, the quality of your condensate capture as well, right? If you're if you're pulling in all sorts of weird oils and pesticides through your HVAC D- CD system, what, what kind of stuff are you capturing when you're condensing that water from the air? And you know, what impact does it have on the ability to recycle that water back into your plants? That's well, a great point, man. Even if you're not doing foliar sprays, let me just throw this out there. You've got a tube with no light in it. So, you know, you're not going to use your UV cleaners in the air handler um, in any configuration to clean inside the condensate drain. Condensate running off of the coil will pick up all this micro particle stuff that's not pathogens necessarily, but it's dirt. And then these dirt become these dirt balls and these dirt balls become nucleation sites for bacteria. And it's hard to get rid of all the bacteria. Uh, you know, and anywhere in an air handling unit or in a room like we're talking about. Um, 
whether you're doing sprays or not, condensate drain water needs to be analyzed and treated um, and probably purified in some way, shape, or form before you try and put it back into the room. Um, but just like you said, if you're, if any of this oil makes it through the particulate capture system and makes it onto the coil, the condensate coming off is a stream of water that's going to clean off that coil and it's going to end up in the condensate. No ifs, ands, or buts. Yeah. No, I, I like what you're saying. And as a guy who loves to recycle 100% of my water, it's one of the reasons why I sort of steer in that oils and soaps world because the bacteria and the fungi that accumulate in the condensate drains, I'm okay dealing with remediation through compost tea, through fermentation, through breeding of billions of good microbes that consume the bad microbes and outperform them in a space and an environment in the tea brewer where they're guaranteed to win. The biggest problems for me is like, what else is coming out of that room? How much sulfur is coming into that space? What other acids and chemicals are coming into the space that are compromising my ability to recycle the water and messing up with my tea or becoming consumed by the microbiology in my tea and then re-delivered to the root zone in a super available way that now is absorbed into the plant? Is, you know, there's a lot of unhealthy things to think about when it comes to that perspective. Yeah. Jeez. That's, that's amazing. Lots of interesting stuff to consider. Um, another one from Andy here. Um, have you had success getting rid of fusarium in a cannabis grow? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of times people see it and they're like, oh man, I'm going to spray hydrogen peroxide. That's my only option. And man, when it comes to systemic fungal colonies coming through the root zone and coming through the water, you need to go back and get cultural control. It's really the only option. You have to treat that water. So maybe it's about getting a water test and understanding what's in your water as it comes in. Just like Rob said, as you recycle it, let's learn about the microbes that are in there. Let's, let's make sure that we, you know, remediate with UV filtration or um, some sort of treatment, ozone treatment or something in the water, and then have a secondary process to make sure that we're not putting ozone and UV into the root zone. Um, but absolutely, there's some some spot fixes that people do. I think a lot of people like to run systemic microbes, you know, get as many fungal and bacterial colonies on and in the plant as possible so they can prevent the uptake of that, so they can filter that horrid water as it comes into the root zone. But in the end, it's a water mold, and you need to deal with standing water in the space, possible drips from condensate lines, filters, leaks, anaerobic water pools, Water, if you clean the room and you push everything into the hallway and you don't clean the hallway, bam, there you go. Water molds in the hallway. Mop sink, water molds, like any place where water is going to stagnate needs to be addressed. And it comes mm -hmm. down to that culture of clean in addition to dealing with the water. And there's almost no point in going in and fighting Pythium or Fusarium in the space on the plant until you get control of the water system. Otherwise, it's just a, it's a battle you're not going to win. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. It's uh, attack the source, not, not don't, don't put a Band-Aid, try and put a Band-Aid on it. And once you get control of the culture, then your applications to take that Fusarium and Pythium, Rhizoctonia, Rhizo anything like that out of the picture will be that much more effective. Because instead of battling the incoming of new stuff, you've stopped that. And now you can let good microbes take hold or good chemistry ward off the effects. But in the end, you know, a lot of times I see people go to tissue culture after that experience and they think, oh man, I need to remove the epigenetic material. I need to get back to a stasis. I need to start from a genetic beginning again. So I'm not battling this with the cuttings that I maybe got from my mom. Because if you fed your mother plant that same water, now you should think about getting rid of all your mother plants or treating it with systemic bacteria and fungus. Yeah. Jim is asking, how do I determine if something is a nutrient deficiency or a pest? Sure. I think a lot of times it comes back down to scouting. So for me, when I walk into a facility, I like to take a look at the canopy as a whole. I like to find plants or spaces that look a little bit differently than the rest of the canopy. And then I immediately go there and address it with my microscope. I look on the leaf surface. I look on the backside of the leaf. I look on the stem. I look in the media. I'm looking for larvae. I'm looking for eggs. I'm looking for bugs. That's always my first spot. You know, like let's find the pest that's killing this. 
if I can't find any pests, if I can't find pustules, if I don't see the black dots, the initial formation of powdery mildew, then I think of fertigation as the remediation. And I think, okay, what's going on? Is this emitter on these group of plants working right? Are we delivering the appropriate amount of nutrition? Do we have a nutrient lockup? But for me, if you go through those steps and you, you can't identify a pest on the plant or in the space, then it's probably nutrient or environmental related. So go back, change your fertigation schedule, think about what that might be, what might have caused that, try and link that up with some pictures you see, um, and get a balanced delivery of fertigation back to the back to the plant. Or what I would do is say, come heavy with seaweed because it'll trigger systemic acquired response and it'll be a bunch of micronutrients to help your plant recover as quick as possible. You know, if, if, if you're losing, if you're losing emitters, you know, a good control system is going to tell you that, right? If you're tracking, like we do uh, moisture removal across the course of a day um, and we're stacking it on day on day on day, we know if we're getting to the end of the cycle um, and the water transpiration rate starts to fall off, that it's probably an emitter problem or some sort of watering problem. So that would be the first place to look. And, you know, we alarm off that on our, on our control system. So um, I think there's ways to just kind of nip that one in the bud. Uh, if you've got a good control system, I'm not sure about the other ones. Yeah. And a lot of times, like, you know, it just ends up being, depending on your fertigation, it's a salt buildup or a buildup in the lines or glomulin or something preventing that that plant from getting the appropriate dose of nutrition on the large scale that tends to be with a, with a professional fertigation approach that tends to be like the number one problem. Um, mm -hmm. And then, then we can go ahead and take a look at changing the dose. But if the rest of the canopy looks good, isolate that space, isolate that plant. Um, think about what's specifically wrong with the controls, the physical and cultural space for that plant. Yeah. And, and Pat makes a good point uh, about identifying the, the, damage to the to the plant tissue uh, as being a, a good way to tell uh if, it, if it's a, a pest that's a great one like in a lot of ways i can spot a pest from a few feet away if it's speckling on the top side of the leaves depending on the size of the speckling i'm like oh you have mite issues mm -hmm. you see the lines in the in the plant you've got um you know some sort of leaf miner if you've got a big juicy bud outside in one little brown spot, you've got caterpillars. Go quickly, spray some Bacillus thuringiensis, spray it in the morning so it has time to work and uh, not be affected by the sun. Release some trichogamma wasps. You know, think about the local hatch rate. There's a lot of stuff you can do to sort of, uh, you know, take a look at the damage and get a really good idea of what's going on due to the damage. Because you might not always find a pest. Pat's actually absolutely right. But if you do see the damage, that's just another sign and indicator of what's going on in the space. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Final, final question here and we can, we can call it a wrap. Uh, what are the advantages of PCO over UV uh, and also HEPA versus MERV 13 versus MERV 8? May I? Please. So as I mentioned before, we use UV in PCO. Um, it is activating the titanium dioxide catalytic reaction to disassociate water molecules in the air, create these OH negative hydroxyl radicals. And for that eight inch window, we are creating a very highly oxidative airstream, eight inches just downstream of our cooling coil, that anything running through it in that eight inches, it's enough um, it's, it's enough exposure to the oxidation to basically shred the molecular cell with a casing on a virus or a spore. Um, it'll even tear apart VOCs and odors and things like that. So um, that's different than UV. So UV light requires a dose over a long period of time. It's a, UV is a good surface cleaner, but if I'm going to try and get a particle of air that's traveling at 500 feet per minute through my air handler and 1,100 feet per minute through my duct. I need 40 feet, 60 feet of UV light at a high intensity throughout that entire piece of duct. Now, again, UV light, great surface cleaner, not so great particulate killer um, or particulate um, you know, disabler uh, because you just need so much of it. We know those systems are out there. If that's your preference, fine. But I just, I don't understand 
<clears throat> what, you know, the maintenance costs associated with having such a high intensity UV light, changing the bulbs all the time, having access into that duct work, and just see it being problematic. Um, that's the difference between UV and PCM. So I hope that made sense. Uh, in terms of filter, you know, particulate filtration, HEPA, MERV 13, MERV 8, the lower you go, so HEPAs are MERV 16, or yeah, HEPAs are MERV 16 plus, um, MERV 13, and then MERV 8, the lower the number, the more of the smaller particles are going to get through. A MERV 13 is not perfect at capturing all of the particulate that we want to stop, you know, one micron and above, but it does a very good job of it. HEPAs, you know, there's a balance point here. You're going to spend a lot more energy moving air through a HEPA filter, which has just got smaller holes, which is why it's doing so much more particulate capture than you are in a MERV-13 filter. And also, you know, MERV-13 equivalents or HEPA equivalents with the have the lower pressure drop, and we prefer to use those instead. Um, it's a balancing point. They never recommend MERV-8. They just, they're a sieve to the things that we think are a problem. MERV-13s do a really good job, and with the PCO downstream doing the coil cleaning and the airstream cleaning, I think we've got a pretty good one, too. It's a good balance between energy consumption and air cleaning. Sure. So uh, I know that was supposed to be the last question, but, you know, when we announced this webinar, I got a handful of questions from legacy growers, from my friends in the industry, from people that asked me if I was going to sort of tackle the conversation about microdosing. And uh, I think it's an important thing to talk about, right? Um, when I first heard the term microdosing, it was, you know, I, I immediately thought, yeah, sure, do some mushrooms and go to work, man. You might be more creative. <laughs> Sounds like a great idea to me. Um, but then I realized that my friends were talking about, you know, microdosing, you know, Eagle 20 and Tetrasan and Forbid and Merit WP and these banned substances. And I came from an industry where we had to use what was available. There was a lack of regulation. There was a lack of study and there was a lack of knowledge. So we grabbed for the things that were commercially viable in, in commercial agriculture and we utilized them. And if you utilize them inappropriately, there are huge consequences. Yeah, you'll fail a test. You'll have to destroy product. It'll be a, a brand black eye. It's, you might pass a test when it comes to buds, but then you're going to fail a test when it comes to concentrates. But here's my real cautious tale here. I've been growing cannabis for a really long time. And before I knew any better, I used banned substances. And then I decided that I was going to have a family. I've been with my wife for over 20 years and it was really, really hard. And I couldn't figure out why it was so hard. We were trying so much, but we weren't having kids. And what I realized was maybe it has something to do with this stuff getting absorbed into my skin, into my body. What are these systemic pesticides doing to me as a person? So I completely stopped. I got away from every pesticide that I did not understand, everything that I thought may or may not be banned. And six months later, my wife and I had our first kid, Miles. What? So to me, yeah, you do whatever. It's a personal choice. It's a business choice. But in reality, there are consequences that you might not be thinking about. And that's just my personal story. So it doesn't resonate with everybody. But the reality is, I think that is the reason why we were unable to have children for so many years. I'm pretty good at any wow. Experiment wow. Th th thanks for sharing that, Jesse. Yeah, I hadn't heard that before. What a, that, that's pretty wild. Um, ma makes you wonder what, what the, the impact it has when you smoke it, yeah, right? A, a flower oh. with banned substances. Talking about oxidation. Amazing. Like you turn these chemicals into, you know, awful carcinogens. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, hate to, hate to end it on, on that note. Uh, <laughs> you, you guys want to tell a joke, uh, before we <laughs> sign off? Yeah. IPM's uh, not a joke, Brian. Nothing, nothing <laughs> I want to on <laughs> YouTube for the rest of that history. So. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. All right. Fair enough. Well, uh, well, hey, great, great job, guys. Thank you very much for your time.
Hey guys, Steve here, Potent Phonics. Today we're going to talk about g- 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 Growing with Fishing. Growing with Fishes. data i know uh at least once a month i'm sending him some pictures or trading pictures or documenting something i think he might find interesting and sending it off to him so um definitely excited to have him on um all righty uh let's pick uh super lemonade we're gonna pick you because we're about to launch a lemonade in oklahoma super lemonade uh if you want to email me at potentponics at gmail.com um we will get you your silicate. Thanks a lot. All right, um, Matthew, take it away. Uh, get us one more for potassium silicate. What's up? Get us one more person for potassium silicate. Oh, well, we'll do it on the next break. All right, that'll work. All right. Let me uh, I think he's muted there. I see. Can you hear me now? There we go. Now we can hear you. Yeah, well, I appreciate the compliment. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'll have to share my screen, right? Is that not the case? Hello? Yep, you should be able to. Mm-hmm. Let me know if you have a problem there. We'll, we'll get you straightened out. There we go. There we go. All right, you can all see this? Yep. Cool. So, so my name is Matthew Gates. I am an integrated pest management specialist, and I have been for the past 10 years, actually. What a year to uh, end the decade on, huh? Well, um, I will agree with uh, my friend here that um, he does often have really great pictures to send me. And... Um, uh, for that reason, he inspired me to talk about one of the pests that I will be going over, which are just moth larvae in general. Anyways, um, here I'm going to talk about some sort of basic and advanced aspects of integrated pest management and also bring in some aspects that are relevant to aquaponics in particular. Um, and then also we're going to talk about some of the pests that I see both in aquaponics areas and just kind of generally, especially this time of the season. So it's a little bit of a seasonally uh, inclined iteration of this presentation. You can find me on uh, Instagram and Twitter at SyncAngel. And you can also find me um, as Xenthanol on YouTube. And I have a bunch of integrated pest management videos about various pests and evolution and cannabis ecology and its origins and all this sort of thing. So if you're interested in that information, you can check out my YouTube channel. But here's the bottom line up front. So I like to characterize the different kinds of integrated pest management sort of techniques or actions that you can make in a sort of like groups. Usually I put them into five groups that I normally name and sometimes I'll change them a little bit and I'll get into that. But essentially they're the biological, the chemical, the cultural, the genetic and the mechanical types of controls. Biological controls are kind of self-explanatory. They are living agents. Uh, Generally, I also like to put viruses into this category as well, although there aren't a whole lot of viruses that are used in integrated pest management, but that might be changing in the future. I know that's a scary subject right now, but there are some beneficial viruses, plant viruses in particular, and mycoviruses that infect um, pathogens of plants that are fungi. And so there is some possibility for using them as sort of a natural uh, bio control agent, I suppose, although some definitions of life don't include them. 
There's also chemical controls. Those can be synthetic or they can be naturally occurring. Of course, many synthetic pesticides that are used um, in agriculture cannot be used in cannabis or should not be used in cannabis. Um, a lot of times that's because they are, they are uh, systemic. And it's important to know that there are different kinds of um, pesticides. Some of them are systemic. So that means that when they get into the plant, they actually move through the tissues. They can move up and down um, to various degrees. It depends on the compound. And that's the reason why people don't like to use them in cannabis. Um, there's also regulations against this, of course. There's also translaminar uh, chemical pesticides. These are pesticides that do get into the tissue and don't stay just outside of the tissue, but they don't actually travel throughout the plant like a systemic pesticide would. And then you have uh, pesticides that don't have either of those sort of um, effects and they simply stay as residue on the plant. Maybe they last a long time, maybe they last a very short time, maybe they're very photoreactive and so they decay in sunlight or ultraviolet radiation or something like this. You've also got cultural controls. Cultural controls are sort of like your procedural controls. They're how you go about doing things, your SOPs and that sort of a thing. And whether you're growing on a small scale or a commercial scale, um, this is an extremely important aspect because in my opinion, most of the controls that people like use or, or actually use to affect change within their crop um, are these cultural controls and they're ten they tend to be very cost effective. They might be something as simple as changing how you harvest or changing um, one of the products you use to or, or whatever process you use to like cure the final product or in the case of cultivation, maybe it's how you uh, prune your plant or maybe it's how you train it or something like this. Or maybe it's the fact that you have caulked up a bunch of holes in your um, facility or your garage or wherever you're growing so that pests can't get in or something like this. There are also genetic controls I like to call. Um, usually you don't have uh, very much effect on this once you're actually growing plants and crop. This is more of a thing that is um, affected by your pedigree, your breeding, um, the genotype of the plant sort of, and its resistances and susceptibilities on a genetic level. For example, um, hemp, uh, a lot of, so in some cases, uh, plants that don't have uh, the ability to produce THC, cannabis plants in particular, uh, some of them have a gene cassette, uh, a sort of a string of DNA that, or, or genes rather, that are, um, that, that have the THC uh, synthase genes that, that are important for that pathway to create that cannabinoid, that metabolite. But they also, um, they also lack certain resistance genes to fungi. And um, a company called Medicinal Genomics is look, has been looking into this and has published information and research on this. And so it turns out that plants that lack this gene cassette are naturally more susceptible to certain fungal pathogens. So it's just a thing to consider. Um, you know, this is true for other kinds of crops as well. Basically, all kinds of plants have genetic susceptibilities and weaknesses that pests and other sorts of uh, environmental conditions can have a negative or positive effect on. And then finally, we have mechanical controls. Those are things that are going to be based on physical destruction of the organism. Uh, although a lot of people are used to thinking of like chemical like interactions and that sort of a thing, things like ultraviolet radiation cause uh, physical damage by like disrupting the, the genetic makeup. It's one of the reasons why sunburns can be so bad. It's one of the reasons why skin cancer happens in the way that it does. It's why melanin is so helpful for um, uh, availing yourself of that and getting rid of that problem. Uh, a lot of insects you might have noticed will, and mites for that matter, will feed on the undersides of leaves and there's also a predator sort of uh, evasion behavioral reason for this, but also it's because of the UV radiation. And a lot of organisms are sensitive to UV radiation in some way. It's one of the first things we had to sort of adapt to when we came out of the ocean, so to speak. There are other mechanical controls like literally just squishing and killing a, uh, a pest, right? The I in IPM is your integration. Um, so you... The key is to be able to integrate all of these different factors together so that you put as many advantages on your side and levy as many disadvantages to the 
to the pest side, whether they're an arthropod like an insect or a mite, or whether or not they're a fungal pathogen or a bacterial pathogen. You have to <clears throat> you have to consider all of the possibilities when it comes to uh, getting rid of pests and preventing them, both in a curative way, but also in a prophylactic way. In this example, I have uh, biological control. We have a predatory mite, Embassius swirskii. We also have um, a yellow sticky card as a mechanical trap which uh, generally these small ones are, are primarily used to tell what kind of pests you're dealing with. They're not actually meant to be um, very good in the way of actual control. But this is sort of an example. You can get sticky cards and rollers that are, that are larger and kind of sticky tape that you can apply as well. There's also mesh screens and barriers, which are another kind of mechanical control because they, they don't cause any lethal damage but they prevent things like moths and um, large insects and even small insects in the case of Thrips screen, which I am a big advocate for as a mechanical barrier to keep things from coming in. That, that gets rid of most of your problems on the onset. You also have crop scouting, which is incredibly important and I would call that a cultural control. It's a process or standard by which you go about doing things and it's important and I train people on this, um, uh, how they go about it, how they take samples, what are they looking for, both in the case of pests or their damage or abiotic factors like wilting or, um, or problems with like the piping in your facility or that sort of thing. There are non-biological aspects of crop scouting as well to consider, but mainly from the, from the bio biological side you are tracking whether the beneficials are being effective as well if you're using any. You're checking for signs of like parasitation or predation or that sort of thing. And just generally, if you see those organisms after you release, if you don't and you're using certain chemicals or maybe you're applying something else, you might consider, well, maybe I'm, I'm negatively affecting my biological controls. And then you can just simply remove pests as well, which I would also call a mechanical. In this iteration, I have a mechanical heavy um, IPM sort of example here. But there are many other ways to go about IPM and every context is different. I, do can, I, do already, I did already give a, an example of different biological controls. I have two videos down here. I'll probably not play them, but there are two biocontrol examples here. On the left, we have uh, Cryptolamus montrosary, which is the mealybug destroyer. It's a lady beetle that actually feeds on mealybugs, not on aphids, for example. In fact, the lady beetle group is um, very varied. Some of them are even herbivores. Other ones feed on fungi, but many of them feed on uh, insects in particular. You've also got your entomopathogens, pathogens. So that includes like Bouveria bassiana, or Bacillus subtilis, or Bacillus thuringiensis, um, and it's different isolates. So biocontrols can be microarthropods. They can also be larger things like birds and lizards that might exist in your natural area. But um, they also don't necessarily, uh, they're not necessarily as controllable or commercially available. Uh, moving on to chemical controls, I'm giving here examples of uh, different classes by how the how the pesticide or what kinds of things the pesticide affects. But pesticides are often categorized in uh, chemical classes. So whether or not the chemical agent uh, utilizes or whether the chemical agent is a kind of structure or comes from a certain place. Um, Let me check the chat real quick. It's not. Oops. Um, so we have like fungicidal agents like mycobesanil, which of course you should not use in cannabis. But I bring it up here so that people know exactly what you know. It what, here's what the name is. Uh, if anyone calls it myclo or refers to it like that, you actually know what I'm talking about or know what this is exactly. And as a systemic fungicidal agent that you shouldn't be using, but many people have used for powdery mildews and fungi and that kind of thing. I mean, it works, but also it gets into your plant systemically and that's not good for you. 
Uh, I've also seen people test hot for it if they just happen to be directly next to an orchard from overspray. Uh, One thing I wanted to add on that. That's a really good thing to add, actually, is that you might be doing everything right. This is also true for other other pests, for that matter, for, for both the fungus you're going to get and also for other pests and biocontrols, for that matter. There is, they don't care about your borders. There is spray drift. There is um, a great example where a few years ago, um, with the uh, sort of a dicamba-ready, this herbicide-ready soybean, lot there were people who were applying dicamba to them and they were fine but because it was a really hot day the pesticide volatized and drifted across so they didn't even have wind drift in the beginning but because of the heat and the wind pickup the compound volatized moved through a bunch of soybeans that weren't herbicide ready and just destroyed them all defoliated all of them it was like a, a large acreage a large amount um, of damage and acreage damage so um, it does happen. There's also things like silver nanoparticles for that matter, or sulfur, which is a totally natural uh, element. Uh, usually in the wettable sulfur applications people use, you shouldn't be using that in flour, but you know you can use it for various um, situations in veg or kind of around your area. It just sort of depends on what you're dealing with, but it is a fungicide it's also insecticidal and mitocidal for that matter. And if you apply too much, it's also herbicidal. Uh, but the dose makes the poison. There are insecticidal agents like cyanotranilaprol, which is another one of those sort of systemic insecticides you shouldn't be using. There's a product out uh, that's kind of new called um, uh, the Spear series. And it's actually, I guess you could call it a biopesticide too, but it's synthesized uh, Blue Mountains Funnel Web Spider Venom, which is pretty fascinating to me. And they uh, so they synthesized it, but they cleaved off the parts that affect mammals and only kept the parts that affect arthropods. And I think the uh, active ingredient of the spear series is this Omega Kappa Venom peptide, which is just really, really cool to me. Um, so I thought I would add that as well, that these sort of new chemical agents um, these new biological agents are coming out that I think will really help with the sort of um, uh, truncating of our uses of, of noxious chemical agents. There's also minocidal agents like bifenazate or hexithiazox or clofentazine, none of which you should be using in cannabis, but um, there's a lot of very common mitocides that are out there that people uh, are familiar with in the agricultural sphere or they become familiar with with some research and they somehow acquire them and utilize them. So you just got to be really aware of this sort of a thing. And it happens more often than you think. Um, and then we have finally herbicidal agents like glyphosate or sodium chloride, regular table salt. Um, both of these things, people will probably already know this, will definitely affect your plants negatively. I've already mentioned some cultural controls earlier, but to go over some, we have, uh, to put a name to it, psychrometrics, which is sort of that interaction between humidity and temperature. Um, so when people talk about like vapor pressure deficit and that sort of a thing, um, this is kind of what they're talking about to a degree. And evapotranspiration, when the water goes into the soil, goes up the plant, and releases through the stomata, you know, this physiological process that definitely has an interaction with the room. And if you don't really know what that is, um, you can be you can be on the um, you can be behind the power curve with regards to certain fungal pathogens, for example, that are very sensitive to a change in temperature and humidity because that initiates the germination um, of the spores in a lot of cases. It's what they use to be able to tell that the situation is ripe for um, germination and it's not too dry or too wet. Your labor operating procedure is a cultural control, which I kind of mentioned earlier, but how you go about things, all of this affects your IPM in minute ways and in very large um, ways, of course. Your physical construction of your setup is also incredibly integral to how you go about your IPM. Obviously, if you're growing in a tent or if you're growing in a um, like a small room in a residential area, those are going to have very um, specific differences. You might be doing multiple things at once even, or you're operating in a large facility or outdoors. This all matters. 
in addition to this, your biogeographic um, area matters as well. So where you are in the world is going to influence what pests you deal with uh, and at what frequency and year to year and season to season, what their uh, changes in population will be as well. And then of course you have hygiene maintenance, how you keep your area clean, um, do you keep? Do you use a lot of bioremediation uh, efforts in an aquaponics setup? Of course, you have to keep things very hygienic, and uh, you can't let things get into the water or think or allow things to foul. That's a very important aspect of aquaponics to consider because, and also if you keep the humid the temperature too high, I'm sure people have already mentioned this or might be already aware of this, but water pathogens can become a huge problem if the water temperature uh, heightens. Do you have anything to say about that, Stephen? Oh yeah, it's a big problem we see here in uh, in Oklahoma and in Texas and a lot of the Southern aquaponic facilities. Um, one of the best ways we've found to mitigate that and actually uh, we, he's gonna be on the panel tomorrow, someone who just installed one of these, uh, Bain Howard of Vertica. Um, I actually just installed a giant geothermal coil onto their main facility up in um, about two and a half hours from where I'm at. Um, and uh, what they do is they put these giant coils in the ground that circulates water through the system and then down underground, which bleeds it off into that 58 degree, 56 degree temperature and, and allows that, that heat to dissipate. Uh, and it's honestly the most the cost effective way to do it with the water temperature. Um, in terms of you don't have to have chillers, you don't have to have a ton of power, you can run it off of a solar panel and run it completely off grid um, and, and it doesn't cost you anything to run. Uh, and then you can also hybridize that with, again, doing a similar method with air exchange and doing GAT systems, which I believe, again, uh, uh, Josh is talking about tomorrow. That's excellent. You would have great insight. Um, so let me continue. Genetic controls, I mentioned some genetic controls earlier. But to give you some specific names, we have um, RNAi, mediated crop protection, which is uh, RNA interference. And so that's when you use, or, or so plants actually have RNAi naturally. Um, there, are, there are aspects of plant uh, physiological processes that allow them to silence DNA. And that can be very useful when pathogens use sort of similar tactics to override or suppress the plant's immune system. And of course, there are possible uh, avenues for utilizing this in an IPM perspective, but it's kind of a new um, sort of a discipline. So technologically, I don't think a lot of this will be out uh, very soon, but hopefully sooner rather than later, um, because it would be very targeted and you wouldn't be able to achieve this sort of targeted nature in this specific way. Um, in, in, in using other techniques. So there's a, there's a lot of advantage to that. And especially from an ecological or environmental perspective, if you can sort of use the natural RNA, RNAi uh, uh, sort of, sort of um, sources, or if you can instill a particular kind of RNAi um, to a plant through breeding or some other process, uh, you can achieve this sort of level of, of deft effect. You've also got general plant resistance. Now, I think it's really important to talk about the terminology of resistance. So a lot of people will have different definitions and I don't think there's a lot of like, there's no, there are a few like organizations that might define resistance um, or disciplines rather too, that will define these things differently. But for me, and um, I have a research report, or rather a recommendation from an organization that I can send to anyone who's curious about it. Um, but resistance is, so you have three kinds of resistance. You have tolerance, which is when a plant can still grow relatively well, uh, even though a pest is feeding on it, a particular species. And it's important to bring up that like tolerance and resistance and all of these words, they are only going to be really effective if you give some sort of um, qualifier. It doesn't, like, you can't just say resistant. It's resistant. Resistant to what? And, and, and to that degree, uh, is it resistant to all the different kinds of those things or only specific species or a specific isolate, for example? It's important to, to, ha to know because plants have various ways of defeating different kinds of threats. And 
if you know that it's resistant, you should know what confers that resistance in the plant if possible. And that's something that I'm excited to see more and more in cannabis. But tolerance is when a plant can more or less grow pretty well, even with um, some level of the, the pest. Resistance is when the, the pest actually has problems or is di it's difficult for the, for the pest to actually establish on the plant, more or less. And then immunity is actually when the, the particular organism that we're talking about cannot colonize the plant. There's something very inherent about the plant that just does, is just not possible um, for it to colonize. Maybe even extremely minimal colonization or something like this, but pretty much not at all. So there are some aspects of immunity where a plant is just simply not a suitable host. And that's like the most basic kind of immunity. It's just, they're just too different from what the organism or pathogen or whatever is used to interacting with. Then we have gene drives, which are um, a method of enhancing the inheritance of a preferred trait. Uh, through breeding, for example, um, you, can, you can establish this effect where uh, it's essentially how we how resistance accru uh, accrues in various pest populations through natural selection. Mechanical controls, I'll go over this pretty briefly. We've got trapping, which is pretty self-explanatory, uh, putting up sticky cards or putting up some sort of an adhesive or possibly even using light traps or pheromone traps in order to um, kill the uh, organism, although a pheromone trap would kind of be like a chemical control and a, and a mechanical control, right? You can straight up remove the pest, which is oftentimes really helpful, especially if you notice that you only have one plant that's kind of colonized by like spider mites, or if you have a really pernicious pest that's very serious, like maybe hemp russet mite, for example, uh, it might be just the more strategically optimal choice to just bag that plant and destroy it because, um, and then maybe apply some sort of a, a preventative or prophylactic biocontrol agent or application spray or something like this. Because if the, if the infestation gets to be too much, you might uh, very quickly end up on the wrong side of the cost uh, benefit analysis with your crop. Um, you can use non-chemical sterilants. I already kind of mentioned uh, UV radiation does this, but um, boiling hot temperatures does this, desiccation does this. There are various ways that are not chemical that you can sterilize an area. And I'm excited to see better ways of people being able to do that in residential sectors as well as in commercial sectors. Um, you've also got various uh, ways of hand killing, uh, which can still be kind of useful, especially on a small scale, uh, but it's a lot less effective, of course, at large scale. And then I have a very, very basic uh, graphic here from um, uh, the Crop Protection Research Institute that showed that integrated pest management, at least in vegetable crops, um, is uh, really well, really great. You get about $19 for every $1 that's spent on it. And as far as cannabis control <laughs> concerned, I would say that you probably get quite a bit more money per dollar of investment. So it's very important that you prevent and uh, sort of become forewarned because to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And if you have the sort of uh, resources that are, that are going to allow you to achieve that objective, like some of the videos I have on my YouTube channel or on Instagram, I'm very happy to help people with insect identification or... Um, various other sorts of tasks that are important to get you started. Um, it's very important to me that people are able to get access to cannabis and also um, good food and that sort of a thing. And if you can grow it yourself or if you're uh, getting it from somewhere else, you can at least assess and know how they're going about it. And then I have a few pests. Um, hopefully I'm good on time. Yeah. So, and after this, there's a Q&A, of course. Right, Stephen? think so. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, the rice root aphids, the first one that I want to start on, um, of course, in an aquaponic setup where your roots are below, uh, there are some, you know, they're not a totally aquatic aphid. They actually, there's actually a, a sister species called the uh, water, water lily aphid, um, and it is actually semi-aquatic. So the rice root aphid also has some of that trait. It can definitely do well in like a hydroponic setup. It, it can definitely colonize a cannabis plant uh, and get at the stem and even parts of the roots that might be kind of 
out of the water somewhat, depending on how your setup is um, uh, made, I suppose. They're considered to be originally from Asia and possibly, perhaps probably in the Japanese archipelago. And they have a different kind of a life cycle um, where they have, where they sort of, they move from two different alternate host species, but in the West, in North America in particular, um, they don't tend to have this sort of normal life cycle. And that's probably because of not being in their native territory. A lot of aphids actually do this. There are two main groups of typical hosts. You have your grasses like wheat, sorghum, rice, obviously, rye, barley. And I find these kinds of plants often on people's properties growing kind of fairly. And if you're in a place where these grasses are grown uh, commercially or residentially, then you should really be watching out for the rice root aphid because many times I will do a site evaluation and I find that people dealing with the rice root aphid problem are um, the victims of the plants that they have on their property uh, hosting the rice root aphid, especially your uh, here stone fruits. You might have a plum tree that you never even realized or people will say, oh yeah, this used to be a converted orchard or this used to be people, this guy you know, he used to grow you know, various fruits on his property and that's really great, right? And I say, yeah, it is really great, but also it can be really great for pests. So you just have to be aware of this fact and uh, aphids in particular are really, really good about having multiple hosts if they're generalists anyways. And then um, just like all aphids, they, well, for the first two traits here, all aphids, for the most part, have telescoping generation, so they're born pregnant, and that makes them incredibly uh, fecund. <laughs> uh, maybe fecund isn't the right word because it's usually clonal offspring. So when they, and they live birth usually, they don't lay eggs until it's the right season for them to do, and they produce a specific morph that has wings that can go out and do that, lay the eggs over winter, and then the nymphs can come out and recolonize the plants. Hopefully the plants were also successful, laid some seeds and now the sprouts are coming out. That's uh, one way that that happens. You also have the production of honeydew. Aphids feed on the phloem sap channels of plants and they've been doing this since before flowering plants ever existed. And they've gotten really good at taking a ton of sugar out of the phloem sap and using enzymes like sucrases and invertases um, and various other compounds that might be produced by their endosymbionts, which are bacteria that live in special cells. And they process all of the sugar and amino acids that are in the phloem. And they can't even do all of it at once because the turgor pressure between the phloem sap and their bodies is so different that they're basically just tapping this really uh, pressurized stream and just shunting it into their body. So they can't even get rid of all of it or process all of it at once uh, physically. And that's why they produce honeydew, which is a super concentrated sort of sugary exudate that uh, aphids or that uh, ants really like and a lot of other organisms like honeydew as well. And uh, you might find sooty molds that grow in the, in the honeydew is sort of a black, you know, molded looking thing. And it's not a direct uh, pathogen to cannabis or other plants, but it does use honeydew as a substrate. So you have to watch out for that. It's also a great way to find out if you have aphids or another sort of hemipteran that might uh, produce honeydew like leaf hoppers or plant hoppers or that kind of a thing. Um, and rice root aphids are somewhat water tolerant. I definitely see them in hydroponic setups, especially well, and I have seen them in a couple of aquaponic setups as well, uh, specifically uh, deep water culture. Um, just some bionomic information. You can find this on my rice root aphid uh, pest primer video on YouTube. But basically, they don't do very well at temperatures greater than or approaching 35 degrees Celsius. Um, and I have here that a high temperature plus a RHPV infection could severely induce uh, lifespan problems. And that's because we might have a potential ally for uh, rice root aphid in the future, which is the Ropalosiphum patty virus. Ropalosiphum patty is a, another um, aphid species, is the bird cherry oat aphid. And this virus is known to infect many kinds of aphids and it actually can exist in plants systemically. 
It doesn't cause problems for the plant. And it lasts in, pl in some plants anyways, that's been tested in for about two weeks. And what's really crazy about this is that it doesn't outright kill the aphid, I suppose, but it does infect their ribosomes and it uh, heavily decreases their longevity and also their ability to propagate, which are two things that aphids really have going for them physiologically. So it's possible that this uh, virus might be colonizable in other plants and we might be able to take advantage of it in the future. We also got septoria cannabis, which is um, a leaf spotting disease pathogen. There are actually very many septoria out there, uh, but this is one example of what the um, pathogen can look like on cannabis in particular. You see sort of like brown spotting. You might even see some hyphae growing out of the necrotic tissue that's sort of died before the brown spotting happens because of the dry um, circular uh, infection points that it makes. Um, Septoria cannabis infects cannabis in specific, but it's, I say that with a caveat because Septoria is one of those pathogens, one of those fungal pathogens that uh, can hyper specialize. And so you might, I mean, it's kind of hard to say whether something's a species or a subspecies at that point, if you know what I mean. I've, I've seen three different distinct expressions of septoria. And one, one thing I think I've noticed that uh, I, want, I just wanted to add to this when it, the early infection is it often really looks like water spotting, uh, like you, you've got water on it during a hot day. Um, that's how almost always with all the different ones it starts to look like and you go and you yell at the guy who was watering. Sorry about the beeping in the back, but um, we go and you yell at the guy who's watering and uh, and then, you know, the next day it's further up the plant and you know he didn't do it. And then you realize, oh, that's not the problem I had. That's an excellent point to make, actually, because it's very true. It does look like water spotting. I've also had people misdiagnose this as, understandably, chemical burn from like a spray application or something. Or if they're not used to seeing what that kind of looks like, um, they might be afraid that they've burned their plants or that's light burn or something like this. But the very circular nature of the... Um, of the infection is sort of a diagnostic characteristic that can help you achieve um, that level of identification. Uh, and I'll stress again that like you might not necessarily know whether it's septoria cannabis in particular, but this is the one of the main species um, and it's, there's a reason why it's got the cannabis species epithet attached to it. But certainly other uh, septoria could infect cannabis and like uh, Stephen was saying. We've also got the dark wings fungus gnats, which are part of the Bredigia genus. Um, this is actually a, a, a frame from my pest primer on the on the fungus gnats, in particular the dark winged fungus gnats. Uh, this on the upper left is an example of what the fungus gnat looks like in adult. You might also be familiar with the larvae in the at the bottom there. Uh, they tend to, one way you can tell them from other kind of fly larvae is that they have a black head capsule and also other worm-like things that you might find in your soil like pot worms or nematodes are very small as well. But um, fungus gnat larvae have this sort of characteristic cream colored larvae uh, or larval color. Um, they've got the black head capsule and despite their name fungus gnat, they don't necessarily just feed on fungus. In fact, they can feed on plant tissue just as easily as they can feed on fungal tissue. So don't think, because I've definitely run into people who've had this interpretation of the name, that they are specific to fungi or that it means that you have fungal, um, uh, they have some sort of like fungal population. You probably have some, but that you have a major one or a problematic level of fungi in your soil. That's not necessarily the case. Although it could very well become after the fact because fungus gnats can vector various pathogens and Botrytis cinerea is one of them and it's definitely a fungus and you can also get Fusarium solani. This is an example of um, uh, Fusarium solani on the right that was uh, vectored by fungus gnats in peas. Um, I also have to tell you about the lettuce chlorosis virus. I've talked to Stephen a little bit about this too. Um, but uh, recently it was documented in the authorized farms in Israel. Currently it is incurable. Um, usually it often, like its name implies, infects lettuce, but also many other plants. And those plants are usually not worth, because they're annuals, 
um, sort of the process that we have to affect viruses, which is typically through tissue culturing and that sort of a thing. So usually if you get this pathogen, which is vectored by the uh, silverleaf whitefly, Bemisia tabasi, which you can see in the upper right here, um, at that point, you kind of are at a loss. And that's kind of just the unfortunate reality at this point. Uh, it's very, very difficult to conventionally treat viruses. And although there might be some ways in the future that are much more economical and democratized, it's just not the case at the moment for the vast majority of cases, for a lot of pathogens for that matter, but viruses in particular. And that's due to the way that they systemically infect plants. One major problem with LCV in particular is that because it's vectored by this super vector of over 180 plus viruses, this silverleaf whitefly, um, it also, uh, the host, it fa uh, it causes a yellowing when it feeds on leaves a lot of the time. Not all the time, but it can. So you don't really necessarily know because the main symptom of Leishclerosis virus is chlorosis. That you're actually going to that you're actually dealing with that chlorosis problem. It's only after much of the plant has become chlorotic that you might be more sure. But at that point, uh, you probably haven't achieved control, and that would be a very sad thing to happen. And you can see some diagrams of uh, cannabis uh, in this chlorotic state. Now, just because you see chlorosis doesn't mean that you have the LCV, uh, but there are places where you might be able to test. I believe medicinal genomics uh, has a test for LCV as well as other cannabis viruses. I think also B. curly top virus as well, which was also recently documented in um, uh, the Midwest, particularly Colorado, and probably is in other places too, unreported. We no, Josh, Joshua Steenland documented it in Oregon last year. That's right. I keep forgetting that, that point. I usually remember the Colorado example. Uh, is there anywhere else that you can think of? Uh, I've seen it this year in Oklahoma, or what I think it is, but I have I don't have testing for it, but it looks ex identical to what I saw in Oregon last year. Yeah, you heard it here first, guys. Like the, That's a lot of different places. All, Israel to... Uh, well, also, I should say this. LCV is thought to originate in southwestern California. So that's another place. So if you're like me and you live in southwestern California, you should be aware of that. The creamy viruses in general are thought of as um, coming from this like southwestern North America uh, area. Ironically, the silverleaf whitefly is considered to probably have originated in India based on a bunch of uh, parasitoid wasps that also uh, seem to specialize on whitefly. And if that's the case, those are two totally different biogeographic areas. So, you know, it just kind of makes you wonder. One other thing I wanted to add about the lettuce chlorosis virus is um, it's one big reason why you shouldn't be doing heavy lettuce production in the exact same system as your cannabis. You want to make sure you're running them in separate um, sump tanks, separate fish tanks. Um, there's two aquaponic facilities that were DWC facilities uh, that I've observed what we believe was lettuce chlorosis virus. This was before there was testing, but all the symptoms were there and it sure as heck looked like it was on the lettuce. Um, and uh, the lettuce stuff is heavily documented. So um, we were, you know, again, on two separate grows, we were able to um, uh, basically wipe everything out uh, and then do a um, uh, lactobacillus treatment and uh, just let it sit for a couple of weeks with nothing in it and, and plant it and didn't have that reoccurrence. Um, again, there, there we didn't observe any white fly. I'm not saying they weren't there or there wasn't some other insect vector that could have also potentially done it, but it wasn't observed. So, Yeah, I mean, these sorts of reports are likely to, to come up. And uh, now, embarrassingly, I actually forgot that we had had this conversation in the moment, but that's true. And that's one of the reasons why I really like to get um, insight from Stephen here, because that was a really great conversation that we had about that uh, previously. Um, but yeah, LCV interactions are, are very likely to continue to propagate as cannabis kind of um, continues to languish in that regard. Many people are just unaware of it. And the way that people share clones and other sorts of tissue is going to have that effect. So the Spidoptera are the armyworms. They are a genus of moths. 
Uh, they're probably not the worst genus of moths to get into cannabis, but they are one that I feel like people don't hear about a lot. So I wanted to focus on them a bit here. Um, other moths that people are dealing with more so are probably the tobacco budworm moth and the uh, European corn borer and the um, corn earworm, all of which are very well known for boring into the flower bud, um, and then they defecate in the flower bud, and then the flower bud becomes moldy. Or also the wounds could transfer the uh, various pathogens like botrytis and other sorts of fungi that just ruin the product at the end. Um, these armyworms do not do that uh, to that degree. They are not really typically um, flower uh, borers or even stem borers like the hemp stem uh, borer. But uh, they do constitute a problem because they are great defoliators. And like all of the Lepidoptera, the thing that they do really well is they grow rapidly and they eat a lot and they continuously eat. In fact, caterpillars, if they don't get enough food, will have major problems because they're literally built to constantly eat unless they have some specific species adaptation that allows them to not do that. Uh, most caterpillars have a very quick life cycle of a couple of weeks, uh, but some, caterpillar, some caterpillars take like multiple years to come to adulthood, believe it or not. But uh, you won't be dealing with those with cannabis. Here I have two Spidoptera, uh, Spidoptera prefica, which is the western yellow striped armyworm, and Spidoptera frugiperda, which is the fall armyworm. And they're both pretty common uh, in North America, uh, especially in the West. Um, of North America, and this is about the season you'd probably be seeing them. In fact, I took this picture on the left um, six days ago. So you can see that, uh, and also for an example, you can see what the frass of a caterpillar of this size constitutes. And this was after I let this uh, specimen feed on about two, like really, really small dandelion leaves. Um, and this was after it actually, um, I was doing a, a test because it had actually vacated its entire uh, digestive tract already before I gave it the food. So I wanted to test how much uh, volume uh, you got uh, going in and coming out. And that's actually quite a bit. So even a very, very little bit of um, feeding can cause a large amount of frass to come out the other end and uh, ruin your flower. Um, yeah, and they developed about 18 million years ago, and they tend to feed on your legumes and your beans and that sort of thing, the fabaceae, uh, your peppers and tomatoes and uh, tobacco and that sort of thing, your solanaceae, and also the mallows, which are in the mulvaceae. So that's just uh, sort of an example of what they feed on. They're generalists, they'll feed on woody plants and herbaceous grasses as well. And here we even have an example of some of their adaptations. Here's a diagram from a research report, which I didn't cite, unfortunately, dang. But if you want the citation, I'm happy to give you the research report. Um, and uh, yeah, so you have, you can see how they've evolved over time. And uh, you have two major types, a type that specializes on grasses because of their sort of tough silicate uh, leaves, um, and also those on woody uh, herbaceous plants, dicots and monocots. Um, essentially, respectively. And that's it. Uh, for this presentation, I actually wanted to give a pretty good amount of time for Q&A. But again, my name is Matthew Gates. Xenthanol Consulting is how I operate. Uh, you can find me at Angel on Instagram and Twitter, and also at Xenthanol, which is the same channel that I will be interacting with in the chat. Um, yeah, so hope that was illuminating. And if you have any more questions, if you want me to share any research, or if you want to check out some of the research on my YouTube channel, please feel free. All right. Uh, we got a ton of questions. That was a really awesome presentation. Um, uh, I guess first off, uh, can you please cover, go over a Subturia a little bit more?